Hi, world history. Welcome to U5L5 Ancient Japan, Hien and the Shogunates. Yeah, so my camera is still not working, and I feel kind of bad because this is actually probably one of my more favorite slides. Um, and I know sometimes it helps to like see my facial expressions, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe you get annoyed by it. Uh, whatever. We'll just do it without the video today. All right, so you're going to watch this Ed Puzzle answer the questions at questions that I ask you during this video uh, that are in blue text, just ones I want you to answer on the Ed Puzzle. Um, make sure you're following along with your study guide, and important concepts in your study guide will be highlighted in red. Like, because red text doesn't really show well on a maroon background. Uh, so that's why I highlighted it red this time. Uh, but the same concept. So students can describe the development of civilizations in Eastern Asia. Today we're going to talk about Japan. Analyze the emergence, development, and impact of philosophies in this era, uh, especially the Shinto era. And compare and contrast the cultures of China, uh, so the UN, Mongol, and Ming, um, and Japan. So today we're going to specifically focus on Japan, uh, which would be the Heian and the early shogunates, uh, including the consolidation of belief systems. Ooh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So buckle up, students. We're about to start in ancient Japan, um, which is about 202 BCE, and we're going to end today at 1868 CE. Yes, you heard that right, 1868. Like you know, like a couple of years after the Civil War in the United States ends. Yeah, that's how much we're going to cover today. Crazy. All right, early Japan. So Japan was originally inhabited about 30,000 years. Um, so that was a time period where more than likely Japan's southern islands much closer, if not touching the Korean peninsula. So it was a lot easier for people to like, you know, get to Japan versus today. There's the Sea of Japan between Japan and China. Um, and it has some rough waters, so it's not easy to get uh, But 30,000 years ago, it was a lot easier to get to. Uh, Japan is an archipelago. And what that is, is a group of islands scattered in the ocean. So here is a map of modern day Japan. Uh, so you can see here, uh, again, this is modern day, but Korea and Japan, they're pretty close to each other. Uh, and you can also see that Japan is made out of a bunch of different islands. There's four main islands um, up here being Hokkaido, the big one being Honshu. Uh, this one right here is Shikoku, and the one in the south is Kyushu. But as you can see too, there's a tiny, little tiny, 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 tiny islands around as well. All right, so first written record about Japan was written back in 111 CE uh, by a Chinese author, uh, which you're kind of thinking, like, really? That's, I mean, like, it's a long time ago, but it's not like, you know, 500, 2000 BCE, like we talked about with, like, Egypt. Um, yeah, so... Um, Japanese language was actually brought from the Korean Peninsula in about the 300 CE. Um, beforehand, Japan did have native languages, uh, but as far as historians know, they weren't written. So that's why there's no written record about Japan prior to the Chinese writing about it. Um, and Japanese is a direct descendant of the Chinese language. Uh, that's why so many of the syllables are written the same or similar. All right, so prior to contact with China, so in about the 300s, uh, Japan was mostly made out of hunter and gatherer societies. Uh, there were small plots that did farming, um, and the fishing industry was huge. Uh, small communities and kingdoms. Uh, the largest ancient Japanese kingdom was the Yamatai, uh, which was from about 1000 BCE to 300 CE. Um, and they did have some contact with China and Korea, but it wasn't anything real solid. Um, that doesn't happen until about the 300. Uh, and the soil in Japan is really horrible for farming. It's very, very thin. So Japan's pretty much just 
a country made of rock islands. Uh, so not great for farming. So that's why they rely so much on. All right, so before the arrival of Buddhism, which happened in about the 500 CE, we'll talk about Buddhism next. You yes, yes, I believe so. Mm, yep. Okay. Anyway, uh, the religion was called Shinto, um, and it literally translates to the way of the divine beings. Um, so it was a polytheistic religion. They would worship a multitude of gods. Uh, most of the gods were just local gods. Um, there weren't necessarily like, you know, like the Roman gods, right? There's a ton of like real main big gods. Most of the Shinto gods uh, were smaller and really focused in on different cities and towns. There's a few that were widespread. I'll show you a few examples in the next slide. Um, but they also influenced life actions a human should do. Uh, so the Shinto gods were worshipped in shrines. Um, and Tori, which is a picture right up here, is an art um, representing the gateway to human world and divine shrine. So that's what those like red archway looking are. Um, yep, it's called a Tori. Uh, there's also seven good luck gods, uh, which are the seven most worshipped gods in the Shinto religion. Uh, they are Ebisu, Daikoku, Hotai, Benten, Bishu, and Fukurokuju. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I took Spanish in college, not Japanese. Sorry for my pronunciations. Anyway, um, so a little bit more about the Heian period. Um, so the Heian period started in 794 to about 1185 CE. Uh, the capital is called Heian. Uh, today we call Heian Kyoto, um, and it literally means peace. Uh, and it remained the capital until 1185. So Kyoto, right here, Tokyo, which is the like current capital of Japan, is right here. Kyoto's right there. All right. So in the Heian period, it was quote unquote ruled by an emperor, um, kind of like what we talked about with the Chinese government too. The emperor really didn't have a lot of power. Uh, they're a lot more of a figurehead. So behind the scenes, the Heian period was actually ruled by the Fujiwara clan. And the Fujiwara clan was a very influential family who made women marry into the royal family. Um, so they had like a bunch of women. And of course, through well. All right. Um, so during this period, they're also a lot less dependent on China for trading, uh, and they're more fo focused on making their own national culture. Uh, they still did trade with China, uh, but Japan became a lot more self-sufficient at trading. It didn't solely rely on China. Uh, they also had the importance of royal courts, like the emperor's advisor and family. They had lots of arts and literature. This is also the time period where women were seen as beautiful black plucked their eyebrows and then of course as you can like see in this picture draw them back in um they would powder their face with lead makeup so lead powder is typically very white uh so women would put that on their face uh and it would eventually kill them because lead is very toxic um and they also wore 12 layers of robes now again this is just for elite women this is everyday you know peasant all right, so the Heian period was actually pretty peaceful. There was no widespread like national war, but there was a lot of minor violences and power control. Uh, the rich got richer during this time and the poor got a lot poorer um, due to corruption in the government. Um, so the Ryomen, Ryomen, there we go, uh, also, are also known as nobles. Um, so there was about 5,000 of them and they benefited off of the trading goods and they kept the money for themselves and did not spread it among the poor families. Uh, so the rest of the about 5 million Japanese got a lot poor because they never saw the money from the trading. Uh, the government also didn't have a police force. Uh, so that led to lots of crime. Uh, lots of traders and travelers got robbed during this time. Um, no 
the government did not have a source of like currency as well. Like, you know, today in the United States, like we have the dollar bill and we have like dimes and quarters and pennies. They didn't have anything like that. Uh, so the money that they worked off of was actually just rice. Okay, so if you wanted to go into town and buy yourself a, I don't know, a goat or something, uh, you would pay for that goat in rice. Um, and rice fields became controlled by the Fujiwara family. So of course, those poor farmers aren't getting any rice. Okay, so in the later Heian period, so about, you know, in the late thousands CE, um, they still had an emperor, but the shogun really was the one that ruled behind the scenes. Uh, you can kind of think about it like with England today, right? So England has a king. That's King Charles right there. But he really has no political power. He's just a figurehead. The one that has more political power would be the prime minister. Uh, he's the one that really calls the shots. So you can kind of think of the same thing with Japan and as well as China, right? Uh, the king would be like emperor and the prime minister, the one really calling the shots would be like the shogun. All right, here is a hierarchy. So again, emperor, he's technically on the top, right? Because he's a divine figure. He was chosen by the gods, blah, blah, blah. Okay, anyway, um, he is just a figurehead. The real one calling the shots of the government would be the shogun. Um, there was also the Daimos, who are wealthy landowners. There are the Samurais, who are below that. That was Japan's warrior class. Um, the largest class would be the peasants and the artisans. So just like the Chinese society, peasants and artisans were above the merchants, okay? Because the peasants are the one really growing the food, right? They are the backbone of society. The merchants are just the people selling it. All right, emperor versus shogun. So the emperor is just a figurehead. No real political power. Uh, he was believed to be chosen by the gods. He was pretty much in charge of conducting religious ceremonies. Uh, he looks really cool while the shogun and the daimo do all the work. And to this day, Japan still has an emperor. Um, the Japanese emperor still doesn't have any power today. Um, again, it's like King Charles, just a figurehead. Then the Shogun, uh, that was originally just head of the military, um, but it turned out to be the one who controls the military also controls the whole country. Uh, so that's why the Shogun gets all the power because they have total control of the military. And after 1185, uh, the Shogun had the power to rule all of Japan's government. All right, so samurai, uh, that is, literally translates to one who serves. Uh, they existed from about the 1100s to 1876. In the 1100s, uh, they were warriors for hires, or mercenaries could be another name for them. Uh, the national government during the Heian period, um, they had, or during definitely the earlier Heian period, they didn't have an, a real strong based army. Um, so landowners had to protect their property, so they would hire the samurai to help protect their property. So lords, um, so people appointed by the national government to look over the large area of land, uh, were the main employers of samurai, especially during the early time periods. Um, and lords in Japanese are called daimo. I know I keep on saying this word daimo, but I never really defined it. So sorry, now you know, they're lords. Um, and Diamo needed to protect their peasants, their farmland, and themselves from rival lords. Uh, to kind of give you an idea of how many lords there were, uh, you can see here's a lot of um, like sectioned off areas of the main pan. Um, you can see how many lords there would be. And during the Heian period. Uh, and you can also see how those lords were then even grouped together into four big clans. Um, that between these clans, there's probably going to be a lot of fighting. So in 1180 to 1185, there's something called the Genpai War. Um, and that ended up overthrowing the Heian government and established a new military government called the Kamakura Shogunate. 
Uh, during the shogunate, it had placed the samurais as warriors and soldiers for the government. Um, so instead of soldiers, <laughs> instead of samurais being hired by landowners, um, they were pretty much now forced to serve government as soldiers. Um, some samurai became very wealthy and had a lot of high status from this. Um, but most samurai weren't the rich upper tier people of society. Uh, most samurai were just simply foot soldiers. And ronin were samurais without masters uh, or not accepted by a master. So they just kind of traveled around and searched for work. All right, so I'm skipping a few years. Japan has a warring states period between 1467 and 1615, where daimos and clans battled for the control of Japan, ended up going to a bunch of civil wars. Japan was constantly being split up between rulers and changing shoguns, blah, blah, blah. I know a lot. I'm skipping a lot. It's interesting, but very confusing. Ah, so Japan at this time, super split up, not unified, but there is hope for Japan to be reunited into one rule. All they need is a bigger enemy than themselves. Ooh. That will reunite Japan. Do you have any guesses? Take a guess. Is the United States. That's right. The U.S. and Britain and Russia and France, too. But the United States. So, uh, before 1792, Japan had a unstable central government. Japan had no contact with the rest of the world besides China and Korea. And they had a law that no one could do trade with other countries. Okay. Black markets and pirating did occur. Uh, but or else Japan was very isolated. Uh, they also didn't have a centralized government to import, export, or regulate any goods. Um, so, yeah. Not great to be a Japanese merchant before. But in 1792, Russia and British merchant ships sat on the shore of Japan. Japanese Daimo were like, oh, crap. <laughs> Russia and Britain are here. If they came to attack us, we have no central military force to fight back and defeat them. So... Japan unites under two main daimos, the Satsuma and the Choshu. They build a united army, arsenal, and shipyards. They also move the capital to what is now uh, Tokyo. Back then they called it Edo, but you can see right here. And then, just as the Japanese thought it couldn't get any worse, the United States comes. Yes, Matthew C. Perry from the U.S. Navy comes with an armed U.S. Navy fleet in 1853. Japan's like, oh, crap, they're here. Uh, and Perry commands Japan to trade with the West. Um, so in 1854, Japan signs treaty with the U.S. and other Western countries uh, to do trading with them. So Japan is pretty much forced to trade with other countries or else, well, they would have gotten invaded. Uh, if you're interested, it's called the Treaty of Kanagawa. Uh, but I won't go into too much detail. So Japanese merchants are super duper angry that the gover government let Westerners come in for trading. Uh, one of the reasons is that foreigners treated the Japanese merchants terribly. Uh, British, or sorry, <laughs> reverse that. The Japanese treated the foreigners, so like the British, the French, the Russians, the Americans, terribly. And Britain and France were like, what the heck, Japan? Don't treat our merchants poorly. We're here to trade with you. So in response of their merchants being treated poorly, Britain and France bombed the crap out of southwest coast of Japan in 1864 in a rebellion. So they just wanted to show their might to, to Japan to not mess with Western countries. So the economic and physical pressure of Western forces uh, led to overthrowing of the Japanese government. This leads to something called the Meiji Restoration. It happened between 1868 and 1894. Uh, and that's when Japan fully embraces the ideas and cultures from other countries. Here's the Meiji here, by the way. Uh, we will maybe touch a little bit about the Meiji Restoration at the very last unit. Uh, when we talk about like World War One, World War Two, uh, I don't think we. Talk
So wrap up today, we defined archipelago, Shinto, Heian period, emperor versus shogun, daimo, samurai, and of course the West forcing Japan to trade. So next up, you're going to do U5L6, women in Japan. You're going to read the selected text from the Heian period. Uh, the unit five summative, I attached a video to this one going through what you need to do for the Chinese technology project. If you have questions, email your teacher. If you want to learn more, email me. My office hours are Mondays from 12 to 1, Mrs. Hinkle's Wednesday. And of course, you're, if you're in my class, do the weekly check-in because I enjoy All right, enjoy the direction video about how to do the Chinese technology project. Bye. Unit 5 Summative, Chinese Technology Project. Directions. This project can be completed solo, by yourself, or with one partner. If you click right here, that is a link to all the names of your fellow classmates in both um, the Miss Corey's classes and Miss Hinkle's section as well. Uh, if you choose to do this project with a partner, you need to fill out this form here so I know who is with who. Okay, you need to fill out this quick Google Doc. It has three questions. <laughs> okay, super easy. You need to do that if you're going to do it with a partner. Um, so, step one, you are going to pick your technologies. So, this project is to com be completed on the Google slide template I have attached to the assignment on Schoology. Uh, if you are doing this project solo, click the solo slide template. If you're doing this project with a partner, only one of you needs to click the partner slide template. And make sure you share your Google slides with your partner too, okay? If you don't know how to share, click up to share and then type in your partner's name. Um, make sure they get edit access and then click done and they will get access to the slides. Okay. So if you are solo, you're gonna pick three of the tip below technologies to research. If you're with a partner, you're gonna pick six of the below technologies to research. So you have a lot of options, okay? Gunpowder, Chinese compass, porcelain pottery, ancient Chinese mathematics, and abacus, silk, um, search for the Chinese elixir of life, the Grand Canal, Three Gorges Dam, Terracotta Army, Great Wall, traditional Chinese healthcare and medicine, Forbidden City, movable type, foot binding, paper slash paper money, Chinese writing. Okay, a lot of options. So remember, if you're solo, you pick three. If you're with a partner, you pick six. All right, step two, you're gonna start your presentation. On the first slide of the template, you need to write both first and last names of you, and if you're with a partner, make sure you write their first and last name too. On the slide templates, there will be five questions that you need to answer for which, or for each technology. So let's take a look. Here is like the solo slide template. So that's if you're doing it just by yourself, but the questions are all the same. Okay, so you're gonna put your name of technology. So let's say I'm doing, I don't know, silk, okay? And then I have to answer on each of these slides the question that's on the header. So what is it? When it was made. How or why it was used. How it affected the culture of ancient China. And how it affects the culture of China today. If you also look, if you pull up your bar right here in the speaker notes, I've also put additional questions on the bottom. You don't have to answer all these questions that are here in the speaker notes on the bottom, but they're a really good tool if you're kind of stuck of what to say on your slide. And of course, if you have questions, you can let us know too. It's going to be the same thing with technology number two, number three, and if you're with a partner, four, five, and six as well. Okay. Each slide needs to contain at least one picture of your technology. On the second to last Google slide in the template, you will need to fill out a works cited page. For the works cited page, I'm looking for at least three citations if you're solo, six if you are with a partner, and they must be in MLA citation format. So let's go back to our slide. Okay, works cited, right here. This is where you're gonna put your works cited, this slide right here. If you have questions about MLA format or work citation, let us know. All right, step four, record your video. 
yes, you're actually going to record yourself giving this presentation. Don't worry, it's just going to be me and or Miss Hinkle um, who see it. So no pressure, uh, but we just want to make sure that you are doing well on this recording. So you need to make a video of you or you and your partner presenting your slideshow. If you're with a partner, my suggestion for recording both of you would be to set up a Google Meets, click on the Share tab, um, which then you would share your Google Slides and hit Record. Um, a lot of students last year also like they just like met up with their partner, you know, like in the library or you know after school or at like someone's house, and they recorded it that way. You can do it in person too, like record like both of you sitting next to each other and doing it. That's totally fine. Um, but I know Google Meet sometimes is easier if you have different schedules. Uh, if you are solo, you can also use Google Meets, Loom, or Screencastify. That's what I use to make all these videos. And make sure you test your microphone to make sure it's working properly. Um, and then here's some other just little tips about like Google Meets. Uh, once you're done with your video, you're going to embed the video into the last slideshow, or you can paste the link URL into the last slide. Let me show that to you right now. So here's the last slide. Uh, so you can either put the link to your video in there. Um, I always like to use YouTube. Um, I know that's like the most basic thing, right? Uh, but you can also share it if it saves to your Google Drive. You can also just um, plop in the link there. Make sure both Mrs. Hinkle and I can see the link if you do choose to use Google Drive. Um, that's why I like YouTube. And if you put it on listed, then like no creepy people can see it and only Miss Hinkle and I can see it. Um, so the easiest way is probably YouTube and just do unlisted video. Um, but if you have questions about that, just let us know. All right, so solo project videos need to be at least two minutes long. Yeah, I know, it's like, ooh, two minutes. That'll be fast. Partner project videos, you need to be at least four minutes long. Step five is you're gonna submit your project. Once you and or you and your partner are done with the Google Slides, submit it on Schoology. Here is the link to the solo rubric, and here's the link to the partner rubric. Um, this is due December 10th at midnight. Here are some other teacher tips. They're not required, but maybe super useful. I made an example of a unit five summative, but note, I did not do it on Chinese technology because, you know, like if I did, you could just like copy and paste my slides and that wouldn't be fair. So I did mine about Roman technology, but I answer the same questions that you do in your Chinese technology project. Uh, feel free to change up the fonts and backgrounds to your Google slides if you want. You can make it creative. Uh, just make sure you have the basic like structure of answering all the questions. Um, I gave you a lot of options to research if you need help deciding. Email me um, or Mrs. Hinkle will give you suggestions. And if you need help finding resources, please, please let us know too. We are here to help you. Okay. Um, yeah, here's some other things. Oh, yeah. Here's a tutorial of how to record with Screencastify.